his version of the seven penitential psalms, deriving from Aretino's prose paraphrase, has its impressive moments. The prologues are in Ottawa Rima and the psalms themselves in Tert Rima. Both of which forms Wyatt handles with some skill, though unevenly. But on the whole Wyatt psalms can be classed among the two-door exercisings of the vernacular. His most consistently good poems are his song lyrics. His few really remarkable pioneering poems in heavier meters hash out from a mass of uncertainly handled traditional material. And even where his sonnets are not successful, they do represent the first English attempt of the age at this verse form. Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey The only one of the courtly makers, whose name appeared on Tottle's title page, was some fourteen years younger than Wyatt, whose poetic disciple he was. His execution in 1547, when he was barely thirty, on a trumped-up charge of treason, put an end to one of the most spirited and promising careers of the time. Surrey was born into one of the noblest families of England and educated, at both the English and French courts, in a consciously aristocratic tradition. Like Wyatt, he was sensitive to the literary fashions that had invaded much of Europe from Italy. And like him he endeavoured to exercise and enlarge the English poetic tongue in translations and adaptations from Italian and Latin and in variations on conventional themes. The first 36 poems in Tottles Marcellany are by Surrey, and four more are included later in the book. The difference between Wyatt and Surrey can be summed up in a phrase. Surrey has less strength and more polish. He is more consistently successful than Wyatt in fitting the metrical accent to the normal accentuation of the word and stress of the spoken language. But he lacks Wyatt's moving and surprising touches. Wyatt is a greater poet, wielding a less perfect instrument, Surrey is the competent and graceful craftsman. His sonnets run with greater metrical smoothness than Wyatt's. The metrical control is clear in the following. The soothed season that bud and bloom forth brings with green heart clad the hill and eke the whale, the nightingale with feathers new she sings, the turtle to her make heart told her tale. Make. Mate, summer is come, for every spray now springs, the heart hath hung his old head on the pale, the buck in break his winter coat he flings, the fishers liate with new repaired scale. The adder all her slough away she slings, the swift swallow pursueth the fly's smell, the busy bee her honey now she mings, winter is worn that was, the flowers bale. And thus I see among these pleasant things each care decays, and yet my sorrow springs. This is a rendering of a sonnet of Petrarch's, Zephyro Torna, A. El Bel Tempo Rimna. But Surrey's nature imagery is livelier and more English than Petrarch's finely stylized picture, and, unlike Petrarch, he prolongs the description of spring for twelve lines. To turn suddenly on a final couplet, this handling of the sonnet form with the lines rhyming a baba 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 is unusual in having only two rhymes. But its grouping of three quatrains and a final couplet is characteristic of Surrey and was to become a mark of the English form of the sonnet. Surrey also uses the forms abab 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 cc, abba c d d c f e g g, and abab c d c d e f e f g g. This last is the Shakespearean form, and Surrey seems to have settled on it as the most convenient. It relieves the poet from the necessity of running the same rhymes right through, which is easier in Italian than in English, and so gives him more freedom. Wyatt, like Petrarch, preferred five rhymes to the Shakespearean seven. He, too, ended his sonnets with a couplet, the majority of them being in the form Abba Abba CDDCE. Much of Surrey's verse handles the traditional Petrarchan theme of love, more interesting are his autobiographical pieces, such as the poem, in alternately rhyming iambic pentameter lines, which he wrote on his temporary imprisonment in Windsor in 1545. The poet is remembering his happy boyhood at Windsor with the king's illegitimate son, the Duke of Richmond. 
So cruel prison how could betide, alas, as proud Windsor? Where I in lust and joy with a king's son my childish years did pass in greater feast than preying sons of Troy. Where each sweet place returns a taste full sour. The large green courts where we were wont to hove with eyes cast up into the maiden's tower, and easy sighs, such as folk draw in love. The stately seats, the ladies bright of hue, the dancers short, long tales of great delight, with words and looks that tigers could but rue, where each of us did plead the other's right. Dot dot. Among the worst forms with which Surrey experimented was the so-called Poulter's measure, a curious job trot which became very popular in the 16th century. It consists of lines of 12 and 14 syllables alternating, such wayward ways hath love, that most part in discord, our wills do stand, whereby our hearts but seldom doth accord. Deceit is his delight, and to beguile and mock the simple hearts which he doth strike with froward, diver's stroke. He causeth hearts to rage with golden burning dart, and doth anya with leaden cold again the tother's heart. Surrey was partial to this measure, and rendered passages from Ecclesiastes and some of the Psalms in it. These renderings which are adaptations, infused often with personal feeling have their own kind of eloquence. He used tert rima, sometimes in pentameter lines and once in octosyllables, and a variety of short stanzas. He could be didactic, moralistic, reminiscent, satirical, and epigrammatic as well as conventionally amorous. All in all, Surrey was an accomplished versifier whose responsiveness to the cultural movements of his time, together with his aristocratic idealism of mind, his quickness of wit, and his technical curiosity about his craft enabled him on occasion to write poetry of grace and eloquence and to write English poetry of grace and eloquence in the first half of the 16th century was a historically important achievement, and one which had great influence on the subsequent course of English poetry. Perhaps the most obvious pioneering achievement of Surrey was his use of blank verse in his translation of the second and fourth books of Virgil's Aeneid. This translation was apparently suggested to him by an Italian version of Book 4 which appeared in 1534, and by the Italian version of the first six books which appeared in 1540. He presumably thought of blank verse as his medium because that was the English equivalent of his Italian models. Surrey was also influenced by the important translation of the Aeneid, in rhymed couplets, by Gavin Douglas, the late 15th and early 16th century Scottish poet. Surrey's translation, published by Tottle as a separate book in 1557, has been praised for its speed and vigour, but the end-stopped lines soon prove wearisome and the verse on the whole has a wooden quality. Here is clearly a case where the historical importance outweighs the intrinsic worth. The only other author named in total is Nicholas Grimald. After 36 poems by Surrey and 91 by Wyatt, total prints 40 by Grimald. In a variety of styles and on a variety of subjects. The first is a love poem in Poulter's measure. What sweet relief the showers to thirsty plants we see. What dear delight the blooms to bees. My true lovers to me. There are other love poems in iambic pentameter couplets, poems of compliments in seven-foot iambic couplets, poems translated from the Latin of the 16th century. French Calvinist theologian Theodore Beza, as well as from other sources, some of which are in blank verse and some brief epigrams. Grimmel's poems are followed by 94 attributed to uncertain authors, among whom Thomas, Lord Wax, has been identified. Though most of Wax's identifiable work appeared in a larger miscellany, The Paradise of Dainty Devices, 1576. Other authors who have been probably are certainly identified are J. Cannon, Sir John Cheke, William Gray, John Harrington, John Highwood, Thomas Norton, Sir Anthony St. Ledger, 
and an unknown D. Sand. Oddly enough, among the poems by uncertain authors is included a short lyric by Chaucer, beginning, as Tottle prints it. Flee from the prees and dwell with soatfastness, probably taken from one of the 16th century editions printed by William Dinn. Sir Thomas Bryan and Thomas Churchyard are among the poets whose names have been associated with Tot. S. Miscellany but whose poems have not been identified. These uncertain authors play variations on the themes set by Wyatt and Surrey. There are love poems, elegies, moralizing poems, poems of compliment, and poems of proverbial philosophy. The worst forms include couplets, both octosyllabic and decasyllabic, iambic hexameters, ottava rima, a variety of stanza forms, and nine sonnets. There are no outstanding poems in this section, which is interesting only as an exercising ground for Tudor poetry. Tortoise aim is indicated in his introductory note to the reader which begins, that to have well written, year and in small parcels. Deserveth great praise, the works of divers Latins, Italians, and other, do prove sufficiently. That our tongue is able in that kind to do as praiseworthy as the rest. The honourable style of the noble Earl of Surrey, and the weightiness of the deep-witted Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder's verse, with several graces in sundry good English writers, do show abundantly. Dot quote. The work was published, as Tottle goes on to say, to the honour of the English tongue and for profit of the studious of English eloquence. National pride in the vernacular, and the desire to improve it to the point where it could compete with or surpass Italian or even approach the classical tongues of ancient Greece and Rome were important motives in 16th century English poetry, which helped to form the ambitions of Spencer and, later still, of Milton. Indeed, the words with which in 1627 the young Milton broke off from a Latin vacation exercise to dedicate himself to writing poetry in English could fittingly speak for these two door experimenters. Hail native language, that by sinews weak didst move my first endeavouring tongue to speak, and maddest imperfect words with childish trips, haul and pronounced, slide through my infant lips. Driving dumb silence from the portal door, where he had mutely sat two years before, here one salute thee. Dot dot dot, Tottle's miscellany went into nine editions between 1557 and 1587. Later editions introducing new poems. This is sufficient evidence of the popularity of the courtly makers, while the miscellanies that follow totals of which the paradise of dainty devices, 1576, was the most popular, testified equally to the interest in the handling of the various lyric and other measures with which the poets of the time experimented. There was no real progress in the latter part of Henry VIII's reign and in the short reigns of his successors, Edward VI and Mary, but the versifying went on. With a great deal of mechanical jingling and much use of the jog trot polter's measure, metrical regularity, once achieved, was apt to fan into the wearisome cadence of repetitious and inflexible arithmetical correctness. Of individual poets who were writing in the mid 16th century, Thomas Churchyard, C.A. 1520-1604, and George Gascoigne, C.A. 1525 to 77 deserve mention. Churchyard, who began writing in the reign of Edward VI, 1547 to 53, if not of Henry VIII, produced a great many poems in the styles of the day, most of them little more than mechanical exercises, but there is an occasional happy lyric in his collection called Churchyard's Chips, 1575. Churchyard's longevity and versatility won him some reputation by the end of the century. Spencer referred to him in 1591 as Old Pale Mon. That sung so long until quite hoarse he grew. Gascoigne is a more interesting poet. His play The Supposers, acted at Gray's Inn in 1566, was a prose translation of a comedy by Ariosto and as the earliest extant comedy in English prose, 
and his blank verse tragedy Giocasta, translated from the Italian of Ludovico Dolce's Giocasta, with the collaboration of Francis Kinwell Rush, was also presented in 1566. Dolce's play was an adaptation of the Phoenice of Euripides. His blank verse satire The Steel Glass, 1576, presents a picture of the failures of the different orders of society with that medieval sense of hierarchy and function in society which was carried undimmed into the Renaissance. The versification is dogged rather than effective, but it provided further exercise for the developing English form of blank verse, which Gascoigne at least uses rather more flexibly than Surrey. Among his varied other work are certain notes of instruction concerning the making of verse or rhyme in English, 1575, a pioneer critical essay on English prosody. Primitive enough but showing remarkable good sense. Moralistic prose pamphlets, a collection of meditative poems or elegies. And a number of attractive lyrics of which the best known, either because or in spite of most readers' lack of awareness of its sexual theme, is, Gascoigne's lullaby, sing lullaby, as women do. Wherewith they bring their babes to rest, and lullaby can I sing loo as womanly as can the best. With lullaby they still the child, and if I be not much beguiled. Full many wanton babes have I which must be stilled with lullaby. The epitaphs, epigrams, songs and sonnets, 1567, of George Turbovel contains some pieces of genuine lyrical grace. And if his translations from Overd and Mantung are of less interest as poetry they at least show him helping to exercise the language by translation. George Whetstone, C.A. 1544-87 A friend of Gascoigne's and usually coupled with Churchyard, wrote a considerable amount of miscellaneous verse in the styles of the time, but is remembered chiefly for his enacted play in two parts. Promos and Cassandra, in crude enough verse which, together with a prose version of the same story, provided the plot for Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. Finally, we must mention Edward the Weir, Earl of Oxford, 1550-1604 whose poems in The Paradise of Dainty Devices and in other Elizabethan collections show the earlier two-door lyrical tradition carried successfully into Elizabethan court poetry. Contemporaries placed him at the head of the courtly poets of his day, but to the retrospective eye of the historian he seems rather to constitute a bridge between Totter's courtly makers and such Elizabethan poet courtiers as Sidney, Raleigh, and Fulke Greville who are discussed in a later chapter. The most ambitious single poetic achievement of the mid-16th century was not, however, the work of those who wrote well in small parcels. It was a mirror for magistrates. A composite didactic work intended originally as a continuation of Lydgate's Falls of Princes, itself derived from Boccaccio's The Casibus Virorum Illustrium. The printer J. Wayland suggested such a sequel to William Baldwin, who had already turned the biblical song of songs into English verse and written a prose treatise of moral philosophy. Baldwin sought collaborators, and between them they produced seven new stories from English history, in the form of imaginary monologues spoken by the ghosts of eminent men who had suffered drastic reversals of fortune. These seven stories, originally published as a supplement to an edition of The Falls of Princes, were expanded to 19 and published separately in 1559. Later editions included new stories and other changes. The most notable addition to the edition of 1563 being Thomas Sackville's Complaint of Henry Duke of Buckingham, preceded by an induction, which remains the best-known part of the mirror. Thomas Churchyard's, Shaw's wife, also appeared in the 1563 edition. Other editions appeared in 1578 and 1587. Besides Baldwin, Sackville and Churchyard. The authors, who have not all been identified, included George Ferris, Thomas Chalona, Thomas Fair, who translated The Unyard, John Dolman, and Francis Seeger.
A mirror for magistrates contains monologues written in rhyme with varying degrees of metrical facility and different kinds of rhythmic movement, from the impressive elegiac underscore, cadences of Sack. Willie's induction, to reminiscences of the old alliterative measure, and various kinds, of jog trot. The poetic quality of much of the work is low indeed. But Sackville possesses a Virgilian gravity and handles imagery with a fine original power, and Churchyard effectively introduces the note of passion in his account of Johnny Shaw. The stories are linked by prose discussions among the authors, in which they exchange views about the significance of the stories they tell, the ethical and political ideas underlying them, and the most effective ways of presenting them thus showing themselves concerned both with the technical problems of their craft and with the intellectual currents of their time. For a mirror for magistrates is not merely a series of medieval tragedies after Lydgate, even though it was begun as a sequel to Lydgate, who remained popular in the 16th century. It embodies the Renaissance interest in the didactic aspect of history, in a study of the past as the proper education of a prince teaching him by example what to follow and what to avoid. The authors are concerned with the nature of order and of justice, with the reasons for human suffering, with the ways in which divine retribution overtakes human crimes, and with cause and effect in human affairs. They are concerned with the proper behavior of a prince and the proper relation between ruler and ruled. In taking characters from English history from the time of Richard II to that of Henry VIII and making them speak of their fortunes, the authors were seeking to project the moral and educational meaning of history. The notion of history as the great teacher was common in the Renaissance and is to be found again and again in 16th century European literature and the idea of selected episodes of history constituting a mirror in which the consequences of good and bad government can be seen, for the proper instruction of those who govern, was a commonplace in Elizabethan England. The title A Mirror for Magistrates emphasizes the political didacticism of the work, and this concern with political didacticism arose from the concern of the age with the whole question of the education of the prince as well as from the specifically English interest in the moral of the wars of the roses and the possibilities of maintaining a unified and stable government without reverting to the bad old days, still vividly in men's minds, of civil war. Queen Elizabeth greater than as being unmarried and thus having no direct heir increased English preoccupation with the problem of government, succession, and order. Writers of the age looked to history and biography to help them show, as in a mirror, the truth about human affairs with special reference to the relationship between power and virtue and between crime and suffering. A mirror for magistrates thus reinterpreted the medieval concept of the wheel of fortune and unpredictable fate to show the political and ethical background of those spectacular falls from high estate, which the Middle Ages saw as tragedy. The Tudor historians from whom Shakespeare drew the material for his history plays shared. In differing degrees, Edward Hall had it much more than Raphael Holin shed, this Renaissance view of the educational function of history. The most eloquent expression of this view in English is to be found in Sir Walter Raleigh Greater Than S. Preface to His History of the World, 1614. In moralizing history, the Renaissance made it more amenable not only to treatment by philosophers but also to handling by poets and dramatists. An understanding of the true relation of history to politics and morality will help a prince to govern wisely and a subject to realize his duty. But when we begin to look for the working out of historical laws on the fate of individuals we are brought into the realm of psychology, and in the triple conjunction of politics, morality, and psychology the dramatist can find unlimited scope. Shakespeare's Coriolanus, no less than his Richard III and Henry N., was the fruit of that conjunction.